أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تسالون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله قولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان خير الحديث كتاب الله وان خير الحدي هدي محمد مصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدع وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد يا كتب المسلمين يا عباد الله all thanks and praises due to Allah subhanahu wa taala indeed we glorify Allah subhanahu wa taala we seek His mercy His blessings and we beg for His forgiveness I testify to the fact that there is absolutely no deity no one worthy of any deification except Allah subhanahu wa taala for he is indeed alone and has no partners. And whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, none can lead astray. And whomsoever he left astray, none can provide guidance to. And I bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is indeed the last and final messenger. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ لِلْعَالِمِينَ He was sent as a mercy, as a compassion to all of humanity fi يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, it gives me great pleasure to be here among you this afternoon after listen listening to the beautiful recitation in the Maghrib Salah of the glorious Quran, which was moving indeed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless our young Hafiz to, to recite more and more beautifully for us and uh, penetrate into our hearts the beauty of Al Quran Al Kareem. Just today, I was talking to our brother, and he said he met a, sing a, a brother from Senegal, and he's a very huge, six foot and over brother. And you thought that he would have no emotion, you know. And he pulled out this brother, took his phone, and he was so excited by the recitation of the Quran by Umar Hisham Arabi, one of the famous recitor. And he wanted to share this recitation. And from the time Surah Al Hujarat, he began to play it in front of this brother, and tears start coming down his eyes. And that's the power of the Quran. That's the power, the penetrating effect the Quran has on, on the heart. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if he had sent this Quran to a mountain, it would have shattered that mountain. So imagine if this Quran doesn't have effect on our hearts then we can say safely, our hearts become harsher than the mountain. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts to the understanding of his book, his kitab, in these three courses that we are about to embark in. The last 10th surah of the Mus'haf, I call it the Madrasa surahs. These are Madrasa surahs or Sunday school surahs. We all know the surahs by heart, we memorize them, but Unfortunately, we don't know the meaning of these surahs. And we find that within these short, short 10 surahs, we find most of the, the seerah of Rasulullah. If you want to understand the history of Rasulullah Sallallahu study these 10 surahs, and you will get a taste of that from the beginning of the surah, which is Surah Al-Fil, the last of the 10 surah beginning with Surah Al-Fil. So inshallah, we will begin with Surah Al-Fil, tonight and try to see how much we can cover before Ramadan in the third session. We only have three sessions before Ramadan and see how much we can pack into there before Ramadan and whatever we can probably perhaps pursue it through Ramadan or after Ramadan. But this syllabus that you have here is, is done completely by my research. It is not the comprehensive copy that I have because it will be more lengthy 
but at the end of these three sessions, what I plan to do is to put this in a book form of all the surahs, the ones that we cover and the ones that we don't cover, in a comprehensive form with more details to this edition, and we'll have it available to everyone who participate in the three sessions of the series, free of charge. Surah Al-Fil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he re re revealed Surah Al-Fil, the Prophet وسلم, was in his 40s. And this event occurred before the birth of Rasulullah The historical context of this surah is that there was a king in Yemen by the name of Dunawas. Dunawas was a line of king from the Himyar dynasty. But prior to that Yemen situation, if we go back 450 CE, is something historical occur at that time. Yemen, prior to this situation that we're about to talk about, there was, Yemen was one of the greatest empire, had influence among the Romans and the Persians. They were very successful, they were very powerful politically and economically. Hence, Saba, Sheba, was the ruler of Yemen. We know all that, we know that story from the story of Sulaiman alayhi salam, which we will probably get into to some extent through this three sessions. Now, Saba, she was a woman that ruled, and they were a very powerful nation, but they were a nation that worshipped the sun god. Now, what happened during that ruling of Saba there was a great flood, and this is all historical facts. This, you can't say you doubt this, this is from Quran, this is from Injil, this is from Torah. This is historical facts that happened there. There was a great flood, and after that flood, what happened, the people start migrating to place where they can uh, build life. Uh, many of them moved to Medina, hence the Aws and the Khazraj that the Prophet later is gonna encounter in Medina, many of them moved to Mecca because the water was there, and they were desert people, so they were going for water. And as we know today, the situation in Yemen, that Yemen, with all that power, it was known as the Garden of Eden of the Middle East. Today, it is the first country in modern time to go waterless, waterless. That is the demise of Yemen today. Now, what happened after that flood there was a man by the name of Uthayba ibn Kalam. Uthayba ibn Kalam was a very charismatic person. So he decided instead of going to Medina or of, of the, the, the Al Jazeera, the Shams, where you have this peninsula of Yemen, you have Iraq, you have Mecca, you have Medina, you have Iran, and you have all these places. He decided to go towards Mecca. And when he went to Mecca, he united the people there, and he became very charismatic. Now, Uthayb ibn Kalam, he had three sons. One of the sons, his name was Abdul Munaf. Abdul Munaf, he had four sons. Mutallib, Abdul Sham, Naufal, and Hashim. Hashim, he had sons. The prominent of them was Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, he had a son, his name was Abdullah. Abdullah, he had a son, his name was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the history of Yemen. This is what we are about to talk about. The, so the Hashemite, the Hashemites, and it's far upon the Muslim that we should know this much of the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he's from the tribe of who? The Hashim, the Hashimites tribe. And during this lecture, I might, I might be a little uh, re uh, rhetorical in my, so we, we can interact more. So certain things I might say in a rhetorical way, so it stick with us. This is one of them. One of them is that it's far upon us that we should know as much as the Prophet Sallallahu come from the Hashemites, the Hashemite tribe. Now what happened, 
Hashim, he set up the center of trading in Mecca. He's the one that set up this trading and this, this, uh, the caravan is coming from all different places and they would trade there and they would do the, the Hajj at that time. So he become very prominent. While all this is happening and the Prophet Sallallahu grandfather is there, now the people of Dunawas, the king of Dunawas begin to persecute the Christians in Yemen. They used to, they were persecuting the Christians. Some of them, some of the scholars says that Dunawas was a polytheist king, that he is forcing the Christian to renege on their faith and accept the faith of many gods. The Christian were monotheistic. He forced 20,000 believing Christians to their demise, either you accept the faith of the king or you're born in the ditch of the fire. And this is a fact because we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in Surah Al-Buruj. Ashabul Ukhdud. And it's interesting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called them Ashabul Ukhdud, the companions of the ditch. And in this surah, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called the people of Dunawas, Ashabul Feel. Ashabul Feel. It's an interesting correlation. This is happening one right after the other. Ashabul Ukhdud is the Christian that were persecuted. And look at the beauty of the Quran that the Quran is telling us of this history, this history that happened in Yemen. Now, what happened after these Christians were being persecuted? Two men among them escaped and they went to Syria. They went to Syria at the time Syria was governed by a Christian king, the Caesar. They, they went to the Christian king and they asked him to intervene in this matter. That this man, Dunawas, is being doing something called today is what? Ethnic cleansing. This is the first time in history we see this form of ethnic religious cleansing like what we're seeing happening in China today. And that is when I say at the heading here, the application and implication of the surah of seventh century, how it applies to the day. That's what I mean through, through the series that what happened there was a form of ethnic cleansing. What happened in Burma was a form of ethnic cleansing that happened in Yemen that we're about to talk about. That because they were Christians, they were persecuted. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this, the two men escaped to Syria and went to the Caesar who was a Christian sick king. The Christian king, because of the geographical location, he sent a message to the next Christian country, which is now today Ethiopia, was then called Abyssinia. Abyssinia was ruled by the Negus and Najashi, and Najashi, which he will come into play later on in the history of Islam. So a Najashi decided to send two governor with an army to avenge what was happening in Yemen. So he sent a man by the name of Abraha and his associate governor, Arat. These two went, they defeated Dunawas. And there is more detail into the story that you will get in the final copy that we don't have time to go through. He, they defeated Dunawas. And what happened often is that now you have Abraha and Arat and they're deciding who should be the rightful ruler of Yemen now. And the fighting begins. They went into a duel, these two governors. And many times, the ancient times, instead of engaging the entire army, sometimes the leaders, and this, there was a hadith of Ali bin Abi Talib when he confronted and he asked, let me go into a duel with the enemy, I'll fight him. This is a tradition that Abraha says to Arat that we're going to enter into a duel instead of engaging our supporters and have a big squad. Let's go man on man, one on one. But Abraha was a very sleek man. He said to his backers, he says, listen, if Arat has the upper hand over me, step in. I remember growing up in Guyana in a small days, neighbors used to fight. And there were two neighbors, they were quarreling the night. 
So they decide that we're going to fight tomorrow. You, your son is going to fight my son. But I remember I was standing in the neighbor yard, one of the neighbor yard, and he had preparation in case his son is being defeated. He had an iron bar ready to come into the fight. Abraham was of the same perception that, listen, if Arat has the upper hand, you guys come in. But Dunawa, uh, Abraha had the upper hand and he beat, he defeated Arat. So hence he became the governor. When he became the governor, remember what I said, Yemen was what? At one time, under the ruling of Sabah, was what? They were powerful economically, politically. So uh, Abraha is now the governor, the viceroy of Yemen under the sanction of who? Abyssinia. Because you remember, it, Najashi sent him there, right? So well, this is like colonial power now, like the British government sent these viceroy, like we used to see viceroy in Guyana. At the time, our Imam knows from Trinidad, uh, you know, the viceroy used to come and govern and rule Guyana, but they answered to who? The British Empire. Abraha was answered to the Abyssinian Empire. So what he did, he's thinking now, we need to regain power and might. We need to regain our economic power, our political power. So he, in, in conference with the Najashi, they decide to build al Kulais, a cathedral. This cathedral, the intent of building this cathedral was to distract or, or, or attract the pilgrims that are going to Mecca so they can come there now and make the Hajj there and trade there and build their centers and economic center. And Allah will reveal this in the surah. That they come and attack, concocted some concoction that this, some people from the Quraysh came and desecrated this cathedral. Concocted, you know, some concoction that we see this recently in modern history. The same thing play out when? The invasion of Iraq. When they claimed that Iraq had weapons, biological weapons, and there were no biological weapons. They concocted all these evidence, presented to the world, justifying that they're going to attack to help the people of Iraq. But it was, it was all concocted. You know what they were going there for. We all know in retrospect what they went there for. Now, it's the same thing that's happening in this situation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed them that they're saying they're going to destroy the Mecca because of what the Quraysh did. But it was all concocted uh, evidence that they had. They were going because of economic gain but they use religion and faith to justify their war. That here these Quraysh, they are pagans, and they come and attack and destroy this cathedral that we built. Now, even if that was real, think about it. If someone can come and just desecrate this masjid, a'udhu billah, would we go and destroy the entire nation? Will we go and destroy the entire nation of that people? When the governor of Gujarat now is the current president of India, very powerful position, Narendra Modi. He was first the governor of Gujarat. And this is happening 2013, and this is a fact. When he was governor of Gujarat, something happened there that was linked to the Babri Masjid situation. What happened, they came into that village of Gujarat and they killed and rape 200 women in front of their husband, in front of their children. And when they finish raping them, they kill the husband and sons, and they burn, throw, throw kerosene on them, drench them, and burn them. This is a fact. You can go and Google it. You'll see the interview, you'll see all the evidence. So much so that the United States deny him entry into this country and declare him this is one of the worst crime against humanity. But now the U.S. is in bed with him, right? Because of his agenda. Now, when he, they interviewed him and they asked him, why did you do this? Why did you allow this to happen under your clock? He says, every action have a reaction. 
Every action have a reaction. The reporter was a Muslim reporter that were interviewing him. He said, the reporter says, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. According to the laws of nature, every action has an equal reaction. Every action does not have a reaction. Every action has an equal reaction. And this by no means is an equal reaction because of what happened, a skirmish that happened, you decide to rape 200 women and didn't do anything about it. So justifiable, if you give the Yemenites the right that yes, somebody desecrate their cathedral, there is, there is no justification to go and attack the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to destroy a people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now begins to tell us about this story and he's telling Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at least he has to be in his 40s when this is revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to reveal the story to tell us that what Abraha set out to do. Abraha is coming towards Mecca with 60,000 armies, men, soldiers, and between 10 to 12, 13 elephants elephants the population at that time of mecca was not even in the tens of thousands so the army it's an overwhelming force the army itself outnumber the population so for example guyana population is 750,000 people imagine you sending three million people three million soldiers to invade guyana what will happen it's an overwhelming force they're coming with so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begin to describe the scene and I will not go through the details of how Abraha, when he entered into Mac, to, the, to, to, to the vicinity of Mecca and what he went through, you can read that in the literature, inshallah. What I want to put more emphasis now is on the understanding of the surah. So, like, I, you know, we're going into Ramadan, rightfully, very quickly, and I want us to inshallah now in this Ramadan because Ramadan is actually it's all about the Quran. Shahur Ramadan Ladi Unzila fil Quran. Actually, the reason we fast is because of the Quran. The reason in the third lecture, inshallah, we'll cover that. The reason we fast is because of the Quran, in celebrating the Quran. So Ramadan is all about the Quran. And it is very, very important that we try to recite the Quran in the month of Ramadan from cover to cover at least once. And when we stand up in the night of Lail and the night of any night in Ramadan, we should read the surah that we understand. And you will see, you will see when you say Alam Tara, and you know what that means, it, it really has meaning and khushu in your salah. It really makes a difference. So that's our objective, these last 10 surahs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-fil. And he begins with the word, with the, it, it, it's an interrogative question. Meaning, just by having this hamza that sits on the alif at the beginning of alam tara, that's indicative that what is about to say, it's in an interrogative form. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-fil. Didn't you see? Didn't you see? He's addressing the Prophet first, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How we know this? By the ka. In alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbu ka. Rabbu is who? Rabbu is who? Lord. Ka, meaning that it is your Lord Muhammad. So he's addressing who first? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? So he's telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, didn't you see? Now, did the Prophet see? He didn't see why. He wasn't born yet. Right? But the language is saying, didn't you see? That's interesting. Didn't you see how your Lord dealt with Amal Fil, the companions of the elephant? The Prophet Sallallahu didn't see. You know, like for example, if a plane goes down in the rockaway, Audhu Billah, we for, forbid that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't allow that to happen. It's a poor example. But just to illustrate the point, if a plane goes down in the rockaway and every passenger perish, 
I will come to you next week, even though you weren't at the Rockaway, but because it was just uh, big news in New York, I would say, did you see what happened? Did you see? I, I know you didn't see it, you weren't there, but because it was such a big deal, I would say, did you see what happened? Like somebody was telling me the other day that he was an ear witness, not an eyewitness. In Guyana, there was a, there was a skit. The guy said, I'm an ear witness, I'm not an eyewitness. That's a different, you know. Did you see? Right? But you will see also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant that seeing is not like he's talking about, did you see the car out there? You just saw a car. Now, maybe you didn't see with insight that it's a Toyota Corolla 1984 with, you know, all these details. If you see with that, like that to describe it, meaning what? You see with insight. So that is what he meant here. It's not just see. Alam Tara is not just see. It's Alam Tara to see with insight. And to see for the Prophet ﷺ was figuratively, not literally. Now think about it. The Prophet ﷺ is how old this, when this is all happening? He's got to be in his 40s, early 40s. It's a Meccan surah, right? So now among him, among the people of Mecca, there had to be people who actually saw it. They might be, they're going to be, probably you were 15 years. If you were 15 years now, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is 40, that many people would be what? 40, 55, 60. And they will tell us that story. Like a lot of the riots in Guyana, we weren't there. But we hear it from many of our contemporary adults that they're telling us this is what happened. That is why Guyana can't figure out 32 and 33 votes today. You know, and this and that, you know? You know, they will tell us these stories, you know? And so what happened among the Prophet Sallallahu it applies also, and this is called iltifa. The Quran is beautiful in this way. It's it says see, it's figuratively to the Prophet, but it's literally for who? The people who are actually there to saw it, right? So he says, Alam Tara. Didn't you see? Didn't you see? And now this word, Alam Tara Kaifa. This word, we're going to come back to this word Kaifa. Because Kaifa means how he dealt with them, not what. You see, grammatically he could use Ma. Ma means what? You see what they did? You see what they did to these people in Guyana? They murdered them. Case closed, right? What if I said, you see how they do, how, uh, how they they, they do that stuff in Guyana? You got to give me details now. What they did? They come in, it was night, it was dark. You know, they feed the dog, they, they, the guard dog some, some biscuit. The dog fell. Then they went, there was another guard. You're going to have to give me details. Just by this word, how? So what happened? We start to see some, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started to paint what? A graphic picture. He wants to, you to see, actually, actually see what he's about to, to tell us here now. So this kaifa, you're going to see all the other words in, the, in, in this surah is coming back to kaifa. What, not what, how he dealt with them. If I say to you, what did you have for breakfast? What did you have for breakfast? Egg and cheese. If I said, how did you, how did you prepare breakfast? How? You're going to have to tell me in details how you make the breakfast. So how, instead of what, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to tell us, this is about to describe some detailed graphic stuff about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with these people. So he said, Alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbuka. Fa'ala, fa'ala, it's, 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 it's interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fa'ala mean did, right? Now, amal is what? Action, right? Amal is action. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to use amal here, but we, he doesn't use amal when he do something. You know why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fa'ala means that he did something without any effort. Because if we to do something, some amal, so you go do some amal, you feed these poor people tomorrow at Satfin Boulevard, you give them coffee. That, in, that entails what? Effort. You got to get up early. You guys got to come. You got to get the, the, uh, the, uh, the Ansar group. The Ansar group. The Ansar group got to get into action. We got to prepare the coffee. We got to make sure everything, you know, is set. It takes effort. And what? It takes what? Effort and time. Time. 
Now, look at the beauty of Quran. Allah uses this word to remove himself from effort and time. He is not confined to effort and time. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can destroy the mightiest army without any effort or time he is constricted to. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. So in this surah, is every word is going to come back to the majesty of Allah, the power of Allah. How? Not what he did with them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara kaifa. And you know, this, when I was putting together this syllabus, I got the six pages, only an alam tara. Only an alam tara. Because we, like for example, we can go into more details of alam tara. An example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any place you see alam tara is used in the Quran, what is to follow alam tara is some damnation, some disaster. For example, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka biyad. The people of Ad, what happened to them? The demise of the people of Ad, the destruction. So any place Alam tara is, alam is used, Alam tara, it's a damnation to follow. In Surah Ibrahim again, Allah using the word Alam tara, but he did not directly associate a damnation, but if you read the next ayah, he alluded to that damnation. So always some damnation or destruction is to follow by using alam tara. So we can go into alam tara for pages and pages. And that is the power of the Quran. The Quran, each word and letter is like an onion. You know, you peel one layer off, there's another layer. You peel one off, there's another one. And that is the beauty. And as you get to what? You start first layer, you peel it off, what? Your eye get a little bit watery. When you go to the second layer, what happened? By the time you get sunglasses, and you, get sunglasses. you know, that's the beauty of the Quran. The more you go into it, the more effect it has on you. The more power it has on you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, so inshallah in the literature, I will include those, those details. So you can go and you can read more about it and understand it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka. Rabb, we know, is Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making a distinction here. Also, in this subtlety of Rabbuka, He is saying, your Lord Muhammad, your Lord, I'm on your side. I'm on your side, and he's telling this story about Abraha, that these people, they deny me as their Lord, but I am your Lord here today, giving him comfort. So this surah was revealed at a time when the Prophet Sallallahu was kind of down. Why? Historically, he had lost his wife, Khadija, for 25 years of marriage. Khadija bin Tukwali. He lost her. He were persecuted. Almost 13 assassination attempt on his life when the surah was revealed. He had just re re returned from where? From the city of Taif. Right? And we know what happened there. He had already lost, coming up to this, his beloved grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. So he was down. So the Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Alam tara, don't worry, Ya Rasulullah. Don't worry. Did you see? Before you were born, look how I dealt with them, man. Take, you know, you don't worry. I am your Lord, Rabbuka. I am your Lord, Ya Rasulullah. Giving him comfort at the same time. So he's saying, Alam tara kaifa fa'ala Rabbuka. I am your Lord. They're persecuting you. I destroyed the mightiest army. Humiliated them, and you will see the humiliation in the worst form ever. Giving comfort to Rasulullah, go keep going with this message, Ya Rasulullah. You keep going. I will protect you. I am your Lord. So then he says, Alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbuka? The ashab in field. That these people are companions of the field, of the elephant. They're elephant people. You see, if I say, You are my companion, what that implies? Who is superior and who is inferior in this relationship? You are my companion. Who is superior? Me. Right? The Sahaba, a Sahabi, was who? Companion of who? Who was, who was higher than who? The Prophet ﷺ. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began to begin the humiliation of these people. You know, many times we associate people with what we earn in this world. Like, for example, in Guyana, you would see the man coming, 
that's the man with the rice farm, you know. That, that's, that's the guy who owned 200 cattle. That's the guy that have the Lamborghini, you know. That's the guy with all the seven daughters. We associate people. That's the guy with the farm. Man produced a lot of potatoes, a lot of coconut wok he has. Right? We associate people with our worldly possession. So Allah begins to humiliate them when he says, Ashab al-Jannah. He, we're talking about the story of the man of the garden, the farms. And his, his sons inherited the farms. And when the old man died, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala painted this picture so beautifully in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this father, he had a custom. You know what he used to do? He used to get up early in the morning to reap his crop. And he used to, the, 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 the poor used to line up at the farm because he would give sadaqah. And it was customary for him that the crops that fall on the floor, he would leave it. And the poor would come and they would take the sadaka. The three brothers, they inherited this farm and they have PhD degrees from Harvard and Yale and Princeton. So they're saying, what, what's wrong with my father? He, uh, that's the prophet. That's the prophet going away. So they got up early to reap early. They say, you know what? We're going to change the strategy here. We're going to go earlier and go early and reap the crop. So when the beggars come, crop don't reap. Tractor just don't go into the mill. Right? You know what happened? The three brothers are going now. Quietly. And Allah, as, uh, as sarin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described this in the Quran. They're going and they go and they went there and they're looking at the farm and it's totally desecrated. Black. The other one is saying to this one, brother, I think we got lost. This can't be our farm. The other brother says, no, but the water tank is there. This is our farm. This got to be our farm. You remember the water tank? They say, yeah, yeah, this, this is our farm, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed. They want to refrain from that sadaqah. They think they're, they're capitalists now, right? All, this, all of them, the father feed from this farm and feed the village and feed the brothers and kids and everybody. And now they're going to change it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala associates us with our worldly possession. That's a humiliation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says these people are the companions of the animal. We're supposed to be the superior over the animal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they are ashab al feel Alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al feel Now we get an understanding of that ayah. You think when we stand up now in the Isha Salah tonight to do nothing, we say alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al feel In Ramadan when we stand up now and read that surah, we know, wow. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the reverence that we have now with our Quran, you know? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this surah has only five ayah, five ayah, it's a Makki surah. Now, it is, it's so rhythmic, this surah. It has a rhyme to it also. It's feel, tadlil, ababil, sijil, you know, it's, it's phonically, it's beautiful. Feel, Tadlil, Ababil, Sijil, and then the last one, you're going to see it change. Phonically, it changed. It doesn't go into that rhythmic form, and there's a reason for that, we will see. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says now, Alam yaj'al kaidahum fi Tadlil. Alam, again, right? It's a repetition. Alam, did you see man? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is turning into a favor to Quraysh, because what is Quraysh doing to the Prophet now? What are they doing? They're persecuting him in the most heinous, vicious fashion. The Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making sujood and they throw the increment of animals up on top of him. The persecution that the beloved Rasulullah went through, that he buried all his children with his own blessed hands. Can you, can you picture that? Can you picture? His three daughters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never let that happen to us. Because I don't know which father can bear that. The Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when his four son died, passed him. His uncle went out in the street, Abu Lahab. And he says, Batarat Muhammad, and it's good. Good, the, 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 the lineage of Muhammad is cut off. He's done with. Don't worry, we keep preaching this and preaching that. He got no son to carry on the lineage. Imagine, imagine. Your father, brother is doing this. When neighbors is fighting Guyana, they must fight whole week and whole time. And somebody died, they put the cutlass down and they say, man, you know, we're sorry. Imagine, 
Imagine the Prophet of Allah. Imagine what he had to go through. And going through this, he still had to go and tell the people of the message. Can you think about that? Am I telling you to go tell Trump anything? No. You will start shaking in your boots. Right? Imagine Rasulullah, the context of things. And we can go on and on the context of Rasulullah. And imagine he buried Zainab, his daughter, or his daughter, Zainab, his oldest daughter. He buried Umm Kulthum with his hand. He buried Ruqayya with his hand. He buried before Abdullah, his second son, with his hand. But who, look, Allah, you see, in every tribulation for the believer, there is, there is a blessing. Every tribulation. If you believe in Allah, in every tribulation, you can find ni'mah. You can find ni'mah. Who was the favorite of Rasulullah? Fatima. Fatima. They say if you want to see the way Rasulullah walks, look at Fatima from the back. She emulates the walk of her father. They were so close, Fatima and him. When Fatima come and knocks on the door, he know. He says, open the door. That's the knock of my Fatima. That's the knock of my Fatima. He would get up from here where he's sitting and he would customary put Fatima. Fatima, you sit here. He says, if anyone hurt my Fatima, they hurt me. If anyone hurt me, they hurt my Fatima. Fatima is the one that run as a little girl and remove the entry from her father when they threw it in the, in the haram, when he was making sujood. He was close, so close to Fatima. And I say, look at the mercy of Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Fatima outlive Rasulullah. That at least he didn't have to bury Fatima. That Fatima died 16 months after Rasulullah. See, the mercy, there's in tribulation, there's always mercy. Look what he went through. Look what Rasulullah went through. And he still have to give this message. So now, this become a favor to Quraysh. Ya Quraysh, remember what I did for you guys? Remember, Alam Tara again for emphasis. Remember what happened when Abraha came to desecrate you, to kill you, to obliterate you, while you were worshiping idols in my house? Remember what I did for you? Alam Tara again? A favor I did for you, can you remember that favor? Why are you doing this to Rasulullah? Why are you doing to your own? So it becomes now a favor. Remind me, the man, you remember what I did for you? Imagine Allah is coming in those terms, right? Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming and says, You remember what I did for you? Alam Tara Kaifa? Alam Yaj'al? He says, Didn't you see? Alam Yaj'al? Yaj'al means is to take one thing and transform it to another that you can reverse it back to its original state. Like for example, if you take water and you make ice, ice can become water again, right? But if you take a piece of wood, tree, you cut a tree and you make this paper, can you turn this paper back into tree? That's yajal. So the, the graphic begin, the graphic scene begin right here now. The, paint, the picture he's painting, that yajal, that he is taking me, what he take? Yaj'al kaidahum. Alam yaj'al kaida. Now kaida is where Allah revealed the fact that what Abraham was coming on the pretext of religion and the pretext of justice, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says kaida in Arabic language means only one thing. It's a military secret plot and plan. So the real reasoning for the attack he attacked openly. We see he coming with 60,000 people. There were no covert operation here. He weren't coming at night. He, were, he wasn't coming with his Navy SEAL or stuff. He come openly with elephants, massive elephants. Arabs have never seen elephants before. He coming openly and he coming on the open pretext that this is a religious war. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, it's Qaeda. It's a secret. He's saying outside it's a religious war, but the plot and plan is to gain economic power. We see this happen, right? We see this happen today all over the world. We see that they come to liberate what happened in Burma. What they just found out with the Rohingya Muslim is that area is one of the richest area in precious pearl. Precious stone, that area. It's always an economic gain. In Afghanistan, 19 years of war, thousands of people killed. If you read the book of the, uh, the National Security Advisor of Clinton, 
His name is Anthony Lake. He wrote in his book that the reason we went to Afghanistan is to get the oil from the Balkans through Pakistan, and we went to cut a deal. He wrote, this is the National Security Advisor, in his book. I'm not saying this. The reason we went is to build it, get the oil from the Balkans country, with Kazakhstan, Taz, Uzbekistan, Kurdistan, to get the oil and bring the pipeline through Pakistan, through Afghanistan, into the port of Kashmir, to bring it and Exxon put the money. He's saying this. And then we're going because, you know what, there's persecution, there's this Taliban and all this plus. This is what they're, this is the fact. They're going there and the Uncle Ben, the, the, the advertising company that advertised for Uncle Ben Rice, they hired that force to print flyers and airdrop it all over Afghanistan and say, we're here to liberate you. That's a fact. I'm not making this up. And they're flying the people, the poor Afghan is looking at, yeah, you know, they come to liberate us, yes. Right? But the motive is different. Qaidahum. Subhanallah. Look how this is applying today, in today's time. The Quran is relevant, more relevant than what we can think of. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam yaj'al qaidahum. That this plan of them, I take it and I transform it. Qaidahum fi tadlil. You see, he didn't say min, he said fi. Fi, again, he painting the graphic picture because he got to do it because what he said before, that it is not what he did with them, but how he dealt with them. So he got to live up to that, what? That word, right? That he is saying how he dealt with them. So in the surah now, he's describing in details that he says, he took their plan, he transformed it, and he, you see, if I say, I bring you, if I bring you to the water, I bring you to the water, but if I say, I bring you in the water, which have more graphic in, in the water, so he's saying here, I take your plan, and I bring it in the garbage, in the garbage, I transform it, I destroy it, I, 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 change it that it can never ever come back to fruition and I put it in the garbage. Fi tadweel. Tadweel is to destroy, to desecrate, to delude all those things. He take that plan and he put it into the garbage. Fi tadweel. Now I I have like 10 minutes more, right? Inshallah, 10 minutes more. Alam yaj al kaidahum fi tadli. So now, when we stand up to read, he says, Alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al fil. Alam yaj al change kaidahum their plan fi tadli to waste. Right? We have an understanding. And you, you, you're probably going to forget everything by tomorrow, but what we do, that's why you go here now and you read it and you refresh yourself. And you, now that you get it, don't let it go. Because you, you're letting one of the, I, I would consider this the most precious thing. If I can give up everything else I, can, I do and take my time to just, to just read this Quran, that is how precious I find the Quran. It's an amazing, <coughs> the most amazing. So now that we have this and we go through all this time in here, don't let it go. You go and you practice, inshallah. When you listen to the Imam now reading Surah Al-Fil, oh, I understand that Surah. Now you don't, you don't know the Arabic, but some key things like alam, alam tara, see, yaj'al, change, kaida is a plan, you know, tadlil, in, in destroy it. We know those key words. We don't need to know, we don't, at this age, and it, it, it's, it's interesting. Imagine if we should go learn the Arabic to understand the Quran. Many of us, after the first sitting, uh, that, uh, forget it, man. But at least, let's take, that's why I, I, I like this, to, Take it from this aspect. So if we read two, three times, Wallahi will stick with you. These keywords, it's, it's simple. You read it a couple of times, it stick with you. These, and, and then when you listen and you read, you understand it. It, it has more resonance in your heart. You know, you become close. You become, you, your love is developing for the Prophet ﷺ intimately. And what, uh, the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then he says, Wa arsala alayhim tayran ababil. What he sent, and he said, Wa arsala, wa arsala alayhim. 
ilayhim would be to them. But again, he got to live up to what? The graphic picture he painting. He said, alayhim toyra upon them. He didn't send it to them. He didn't send the board to them. But he sent them upon them. Alayhim wa arsala alayhim toyran. Toyran, toyra is bird. Toyra is bird. Right? Now, look, he puts a tanween, toyran. Just by putting this tanween, it's indicative of that these birds are terrifying birds. They're com coming with a speed. A babil is, it's, it's called a collective plural in Arabic, meaning that it's describing birds of different species. It's not one bird. And the description of the old folks among the Prophet Sallallahu again, who see, they were saying that, you know what? After that incident, we never see these boards back again. And we didn't know where these boards come from. You know, we know about Saki Winky and Blueback and all these boards. We know about these boards. But we only see this board come one time in the year, and that's it. Some of them describe these boards were coming from the Red Sea. Some of them say it was coming from the direction of Yemen, right where this army is coming from. It's coming from there. Some of them say it's coming from all direction. And one of them who described it very well, that who was alive, was Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ. And there's a beautiful story that you will see in the literature here. When Abraham came and he confiscated the camel of the, of the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, and Abraham heard of this man. He said, I want to see this man, who this man, Abdul Muttalib is. Abraham was set, he set up tent, and he's sitting there, and he's on his throne. And the grandfather of the Prophet Sallam walked in. And just by looking at the grandfather of Rasulullah, he was moved. The personality, the majesty of Rasul, the, the grandfather of Rasulullah walked into the tent. Abraham, you know, you know, sometimes you have this, this, Auto, your autonomic nervous system. What happened if I throw cold water in your face, right? What happened? You have a, you don't, you can't even hold back yourself. You're gonna do something, right, to protect yourself. So what happened? Abraham had, had that moment. He had that moment. He just get up from his throne and come to sit at the level of the prophet's grandfather. And he said, um, the prophet's grandfather says, before you address whatever you wanna address, I'm here for my camels. So he was shocked. He was shocked. He says, man, I'm coming to destroy this Kaaba and all your people and you tell him where your camels? He said, yes, I'm here for my camels. He says, you see, this house is the house of Allah. You deal with him and this is my camel. You go and do what you got to do there. You know, he said, I lost all respect for you. Abraham is saying, the Prophet said, this is my property. I come from my property. You deal with the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's a lot of details of his journey coming into the Kaaba. Now, he's saying, وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلٌ Ababil means birds of different species. It's coming from different parts of the sky. It's coming. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَرْمِيهِمْ تَرْمِيهِمْ Meaning that these birds are coming from a high altitude. Now, if I take this phone and I drop it from here, what happens? If I go to the ceiling now and drop this phone, what's going to happen? You're coming at what? A higher velocity. This word here, tarmi, is specific. It's saying that this word, it says, in the regular translation you read it, it says throw. But it's not throw. If I throw something to you, you have to describe more. Where are you throwing it from? The top story? Or are you throwing it from in front of me? You got to define it more. In the Arabic language, Tarmi specifically means that he is launching it from an altitude high. So the bird is coming for viciously from all angles, different species of bird, Tarmi, and it's the present tense, present future tense, meaning that Tarmihim bihijaratim min sijil, it means that this bird, you see, if he had used Rama, Rama is true, right? But Rama means that he throw only once. So what he doing? He painting an image that Tarmi is the bird continuously pebble come. He not throw once. 
them come and they're launching the pebbles, launching the pebbles. Continuously, there is no disruption. It is a raining of pebbles coming. Tarmihim from a high altitude, Ibn Abbas described this. He described, he says that the birds would come and they would launch this missile, this pebble, with pinpoint accuracy that it would pierce the body of the soldiers and it would exit. And as soon as it pierced, the body becomes pus and it becomes infected immediately. The forest's greatest disaster for the Arabs was this disaster. That they describe it, Ibn Abbas says, it become a plague, plague like because the corpse, 60,000 soldiers, were lying all over the desert. And you know where this was? This was between who made Hajj? It's between Muzdalifa and Mina. Now, Look at the detail. It's between Muzdalifa and Mina. The Prophet Sallallahu says in one authentic hadith that, and I noticed this, when you're walking, I noticed some of the hujjah, they will walk fast when they get to that area. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi when you get to that area, walk fast because that's a place of damnation. That's when we go to the Dead Sea also. We shouldn't go, that's a place of damnation. That is Sodom and Gomorrah. That is where people of, of lewdness and inequity, you shouldn't go, you, should, you can go and look at it. It's one of the signs of Allah. But people go and bathe in this thing and say that there's healing property in it. And the salt they bring it and sell it and all this stuff. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is right between the valley, between Mina and Musdalifa. This is all happening there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he send these birds, tarmihim bi hijaratim min sijil. That these, these, and, and look at the beauty. He says, min, min sijil. He says, these clay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is made, Sijil is a Farsi word. Sijil is a Farsi word that was adopted in the Arabic language, like Urdu. Many of the uh, older folks, they know Urdu, right? Sijil means, it, it literally means two words, a compound word. In Farsi, it's Sangil. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Sijil is made out of sand, water, Sun and wind. Now, sand, it's, what's sand? You take sand, but when you take, when you take sand and with the element of nature and it roll and the breeze and the water come and it form that big clay, that is sijil. That is sijil. You know, like one, scholar, one person says, you know, why, why wine is haram? Well, to one of the old scholars, he says, why wine is haram? That it's, it's from grapes. Why is haram? You know, it's interesting, and, and I, I want to share this because I know our brothers are very concerned of what happened in China. There's a, there's a site, it's a, very, it's a very authentic site, it's called Patheos. It's a news, news uh, feed that we get. There was an American woman who went to China, and she, there's a mosque in China that is an all-woman mosque. The Imam is a woman. And she went there and she accepted Islam. She accepted Islam. And after she accepted Islam, they want to celebrate that this sister accepted Islam. So she went to another uh, masjid where they are male and female and stuff. And they were all drunk. In the masjid, they were drunk. They were drinking in celebration. So she was like, I thought this is haram. They said, no, no, one of the imam, Imam Hanifa, he says that you can drink any alcohol as long as it's not made out of grape or dates. They have that ruling to rule that they can drink, that they can drink. So, you know, some things happen, you, you, you know, it's strange things are happening in this ummah. Very strange things are happening in this ummah. And this is why we need majlis like this, where we can bring, we should have all our youths in here tonight listening to these lectures and learning about the kitab of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanahu wa ta'ala. They ask the old man, he says, grapes, why you can't drink wine? So the old man says, if I take water, son, and I throw it in your face, can it do anything to you? No. He said, no. If I, if I take a dust and throw it in your face, can it do anything to you? No. But if I take, if I take some dust and some water, and I bake it into one stone, and I hurl it at your face now, can it do anything to you? Yeah, you can hurt me. He says, when you take wine, and you put, when you take grape, and you change it into something, it has harmful effect. It has a harmful effect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this sijil, this baked clay, that when the, the description is that 
it was it was launched to the soldiers. And look look at the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Tarmihim bi hajaratim min sijjin. And we need to finish, so I'll go through the last ayah. Faja'alahum, faja'alahum qa'asfim maqul. Faja'ala, he uses this word before. When he says what he did to their qaida, yaj'al, yaj'al, trans, transform their plan. So what he's saying here now, not only their plan he transformed, he's transforming them too now here. He says, فَجَعَلَهُمْ جَعَلَ كَأَسْفٍ مَقُولٍ That what he did to them, he made them ma'kul is to, to take something, change it, and to, like, you know, you, you know, us is the wind. So, he changed them not only to, not to a twig. You know a twig, you can pick up it, you can hold them, and you can break them and stuff. He said that they become like leaves. You know the leaves that get dry and fall on the tr floor? When the wind comes now, those leaves are so brittle. When the wind blows those leaves, you break them up. They become like that. He transformed them into that. Ka'asfim <laughs> makul. Now, what happened with the phonic? Feel, tadlil, ababil, sijil, makul. This is, he changed it because this is to send the message that this is actually what becomes of this mighty army because of their arrogance. Because of their arrogance and the power that they were coming with, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obliterate them from this planet and make them an example for all of mankind and give honor and credence to the Quraysh that after when you know Dunawas you know how Dunawas died the king that was killing the Christians when Abraha came he died by drowning he rode his horse into the water and drowned who died like that Pharaoh the demise of Pharaoh died like that just like that he died like that now, Abraha, how did he die? All the soldiers died in Mecca. Abraha, Allah allowed to go back to Yemen. When he got to the streets of Yemen, and the Yemenites is looking at the body, they are wondering, what kind of weapons these Quraysh use? How do we plan to attack these Quraysh now? Is this biological warfare? What kind of weapons is used here? What happened? They could not, the Romans were backing them, Abyssinians were backing them. They could not the, figure out the weapon to counter-attack counter that weapon that Quraysh was used. And the Quraysh didn't do anything. Did the Quraysh do anything? The Quraysh was hiding. As a matter of fact, the Quraysh was hiding. That is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will finish with this quotation of one sheikh. His name is Shakespeare. <laughs> Shakespeare said, that, O oh man, O oh man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, little brief authority, little brief power you got, O oh man, the, dancing with fantastic tricks to heavens that you make the angels weep. Shakespeare, Shake, Shakespeare, he said that, of arrogance, that we are blessed sometimes with little wealth. We are blessed with little authority, little power, little position. Humble yourself. Don't dance, he's saying, don't dance with showing off to the heavens. You don't think the heavens are watching you? Meaning, Allah is watching you. He's watching you. And you make the angels weep. Look at the crying of this guy. Look at this guy. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts to the understanding of the Quran al Kareem. Alhamdulillah, I think we covered so to feel in a somewhat comprehensive manner. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala imbibe in our hearts now that when we listen to His Quran in this surah, it's just this one surah, we can understand it. When we recite it, when we read it in our salah, we can reflect upon it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us, open our hearts to the understanding of His Kitab and to be able to retain it and to be able to practice it insha'Allah wa kuli kawli as was Bismillahirrahmanirrahim 
والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر